distinguished speaker and dear participants. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, aloha. Welcome to our very special webinar on regional security of South and Southeast Asia. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, a political, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. To talk on a very special topic of today, we have very distinguished speaker, Lieutenant General, retired Dan Fig Leaf, US Air Force. Lieutenant General Dan Fig uh, Leaf is a managing director of Phase Minus One LLC PMI, a company he formed with Dr. Ala Murabit in 2017. His focus area include the US-Vietnam relationship, peace on the Korean Peninsula, conflict resolution, effective governance, strategic leadership, and women, peace, and security. And he also provides consulting service to military and security concepts, require, requirements, generation, and advanced technology. He's a senior advisor for a government business to Serego, an adaptive learning company, widely known by his uh, fighter pilot Monkia Fig. He is a decorated combat fighter pilot and leader with more than 3,600 flight hours, including F-16 and F-15, combat mission in Europe and Middle East. He is a respected educator and experienced defense industry executive. He was a director, Daniel K. Anuk, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu from 2012 to 2017. He worked in the defense industry as vice president for security for a strategic initiative at Northrop Grumman in, in Information System from 2008 to 2012. His 33 years USF career culminated in duties as a deputy commander of US Pacific Command PACCOM from 2005 to 2008. Other postings include vice commander of Air Force Space Command, USF director of operational combat requirement and command of six different organizations. Figures work with leaders of every nation in the Indo-Pacific, Indo-Asia Pacific region, expect North Korea. He delivered guest lectures at King's College London, the Vietnam Academy of Social Science, China's PLA Political Academy in Xi'an, and the Pakistan National Defense University, among others. His military experience include his time at PASCOM, a tour of duty at headquarters Pacific Air Service Force, four time of duty assignment in both the Republic of Korea and Japan, and temporary military duty across the region. As a civilian, he worked as an overseas national exercise uh, senior observer for PACCOM and the Northrop Grumman gained industry experience from Asia Pacific customers. Lieutenant General Leaf served on numerous nonprofit uh, boards and councils. He is the chairman of the board of management of the Armed Services, YMCA Hawaii, served as a vice president and member of the executive committee of the board of directors of the Paul Harvey Aviation Museum. He is on the board of advisory, advisors of the Spirit of America and recently joined the board of director of Think Tech Hawaii. He was previously a member of US Air Force Scientific Advisory Board and the governing board of the Fairfax County, Virginia Partnership to Prevent the Endless homeless homelessness. His civilian and military decorations include the Secretary of Defense Medal of, for Outstanding Public Service, Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Distinguished Service Medal, Legend of Merit, Bronze Star, and the Air Medal. He graduated with honors from the Air Force Reserve Officers Training Corps, undergraduate pilot training, the US Army Command and the General Staff College, and Air War College, where he won the Secretary of the Air Force Leadership Award. In 2017, Fig on the Oslo Forum's first ever Peace Writer Prize for his essay on an urgency practical approach to the Korean Peninsula. General Leaf is an avid Harley Davidson rider, enjoyed tinkering on his motorcycle and extensively modified Ford Mustang GT and takes frequent doses of humility from the games of golf. Fig, the host of Figments, the Power of Imagination, and Figments on Reality on Think Tank Hawaii. He is a prolific, prolific author whose publication and interviews include Countering Collective Nuclear Blackmail, 
which was published in 2022 with Howard Thompson, a real clear defense 2021, missile defense for, Gun for Guam, Hawaii and beyond, Honolulu Star Advisor. In 2020, he wrote, Biden must focus early on North Korea, published by Honolulu Star. Advisor 2018, we have Japan's risk as is a sore rather choice, the Japan Times. General Fick, once again, welcome to our program. Uh, please make your remarks in 20 minutes, which is followed by question and answers. The program is streaming live on several social media pages. Please follow us on Twitter, like on Facebook, and subscribe our nice Nepal YouTube channel. Thank you, and over to you, General Fick. Thank you, Dr. Jaiswal. Thanks for that um, uh, extensive introduction, which tells our participants that I'm old. I am. Uh, I've been around for a while, seen a lot, and uh, I hope I've learned some lessons. While the title and much of the biography focuses on my military experience, we all have to recognize that I retired 14 years ago from the Air Force. <laughs> I'll never really retire, as you can tell from the other activities, but my perspectives have been shaped at least as much by my experience post-Air Force, especially that as the director of the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and I'm certain we have some alumni uh, uh, participating today, and a big aloha to you all from, from Honolulu. Uh, I think of myself not as a former fighter pilot uh, now, but more as a future-focused peacemaker. And that's just what I would like to do with the years I have left. And my company, Phase Minus One, has a name that alludes to that. And I'll explain it because it's relevant to my view of regional and global security. Phase minus one, that name comes from my experience as the deputy commander, U.S. Pacific Command. When I arrived in that job in 2005 for the first time, I was reviewing a plan with our very brilliant strategic planners about one of the things that could happen. Perhaps we'll talk about one of those things today. Um, and the plan had phases, as U.S. military plans do. Phase zero is a dangerous status quo. Phase one is things are getting tense, often called initial or uh, heightened tensions. Uh, phase two, initial hostilities. Phase three, war and beyond. And after hearing the very extensive briefing with all the plans to deter or prevent conflict, kind of, I asked, where's our phase minus one plan? And the planners looked at me like I had two heads. But my point was, if you don't plan to change the dangerous status quo, then you're not going to get to a better place except by accident. So thus, my approach is phase minus one. I am not affiliated with the United States government in any way. I no longer have access to classified information by my choice, because therefore, I can say whatever I think. And I will. Um, and as for attribution, uh, at my age, it's a, you know, feel free to attribute things to me. Geez, just please get it right. Be correct about what you say. I'm not inclined to take sides on matters, but my perspective is American and has the natural bias of where I sit and where I've lived in the country that I served for many years. But I'm not inclined to take sides because in what I consider a very dangerous time, we are all in this together, um, truly. Big countries, small countries, countries that are mostly coastline, countries that are landlocked. Wherever we are in the region, in the world, uh, we have a shared stake. And as part of that shared stake, I'd like to dis start my discussion of security by looking at some extra regional issues that have significant regional security implications for South Asia and Southeast Asia and actually everywhere else. But I do consider South Asia and Southeast Asia uh, really the focal point of world security. And one might think, well, it's Europe right now with Russia and Ukraine. But given commerce and population and demographics, South Asia and Southeast Asia are the places that we have to build peace and prosperity in a free 
rules-based environment if the rest of the world is going to succeed. I, I truly believe that. I've spent much of my adult life in Asia, so I am biased towards the region, but I think a case can be made that what happens in our region, since I live in the middle of the Pacific, uh, matters to the entire world as much or more than what happens elsewhere. So what are those re extra regional uh, security matters that have broad uh, broad impact and therefore we have to worry about? Frankly, I'm talking about things we have to worry about, and it's a worrisome time. The first one is the lowering of the nuclear threshold. And as Dr. Jaiswal mentioned, in 2022, with a fellow fighter pilot, we published, an, it was June of this year, we published an article uh, saying that the concept of nuclear blackmail must be addressed. And that's in real clear defense. You can find it there. I will also post my email, uh, company email, on the chat window in, in a bit when I'm not busy talking. And uh, Fee, you can ask me for any of the articles I've got via that, and I'll provide them directly. But the change in the nuclear threshold is extremely dangerous. Now, this article was sadly prescient because recently it's become a very hot topic. Uh, I saw that coming because of uh, President Putin's implied uh, implication that he would resort to any means to achieve his objectives in Ukraine. And subsequently, he's been more explicit and other Russian officials have been more explicit. But that's not the only reason. North Korea had been a rogue nuclear state. They were uh, signators of the non-proliferation treaty and then uh, left that. Not that they can do that, actually. But um, now with their partnership with Russia and with China, we're setting a standard for use of nuclear weapons that is much lower as they recently passed a new law that allows preemptive use or use in the event of a decapitation event where their leader is uh, killed. And it has some other implications, but the bottom line is it lowers the nuclear threshold. It increases the likelihood and the number of circumstances where nuclear weapons might be used, and that's dangerous. Um, given the uh, expanded partnership between China and Russia and the different approach to uh, North Korea that both countries have shown recently, more enabling, less restraining, if you will, the aggressive actions of North Korea, North Korea, uh, I'll be very interested to see what China says coming out of the 20th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, which is going on right now. Um, I'll be even more interested as an indicator to how China would react to um, a subsequent or to a, a North Korean nuclear test. There have been many predictions that one of those is going to happen soon, probably after the Congress, the Communist Party of China's Congress. In the past, China has responded responsibly, and in fact, in, with their initial test in 2006, probably a, the high point, in my mind, of China's responsible role in the world community when they condemned uh, the nuclear blast. Will they do the same, or are they going, or are they going to be an enabler? If they're an enabler, if they don't say much, or don't say anything of impact, don't impose uh, sanctions, uh, global or unilateral, then that further lowers the nuclear threshold. So what? <laughs> so what? Obviously, nuclear war is extraordinarily destructive, even on a limited basis, as we saw in World War II. But this has impact on, will have impact on the world economically, structurally, every way you can imagine. But I'd rather talk about the solution. I think that all responsible nations, big and small, should speak up at this time, before it's too late, against the use of nuclear weapons in 
a limited blackmail type of scenario, whether it's in Ukraine or in Korea or in the event of Chinese military action against Taiwan. And I think that our voices, all of our voices should be loud and clear and part of the deterrent construct. One of my concerns from the, affair, from the American perspective is that deterrence is a very complicated business, one of the most difficult intellectual endeavors there is. And given that the threshold has changed, we have to rethink nuclear deterrence. That's, that's not something you do at a, in a 45 minute webinar. Um, so uh, this is a dangerous time. Uh, the entire world has to participate in dialing down the nuclear dial. And I hope that those of you in positions to influence, no matter how small a role you may think it is, uh, speak up on that. The next extra regional issue that I want to talk about is China, Taiwan. Uh, you know, I was in Beijing in uh, August, first week of August in 2017, participating in a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace a uh, crisis action working group with senior Chinese and U.S. Uh, former officials gathering to try to figure out how to back down from a crisis and manage uh, a situation. It was the participants on both sides were noteworthy and thoughtful. But I came away from that, from the statements of our Chinese participants, convinced that China was going to decide to make Taiwan a problem. Now, it had been an unsettled issue for years and a, a matter of significance to the Chinese uh, government for a long time and the, the issue of the one China policy. So it's not like this was out of the blue, but it was a different tenor, a different tone, certainly from uh, what we saw, which was a pretty uh, constructive engagement uh, uh, situation between uh, the mainland and Taiwan during the Taiwan's presidency of Ma Ying-jeou. This was different, and it has been different. And um, and I'm not a member of the Chinese Communist Party. You probably know that. And I can't look at it from a Chinese perspective. But I can't imagine why they would choose war. Uh, Taiwan is a small problem. They see it as a problem of sovereignty. But why would you take military action to do that? Not for me to debate. It's for me to say that this could happen. This could happen. I first went to Taiwan in 1982. I've been in the region, as I said, most of my adult life. Um, much of the uh, much of the time there have been some form of tensions, they rise, they fall. This is a path to conflict. And again, nations big and small have a voice and should express their concern because the impact of war in Taiwan will be extraordinary. Extraordinary to everybody the, because it will become a complete fracture of U.S.-China relations. It will have devastating economic uh, impacts. And frankly, should China resort to military action, it will result in death and destruction, uh, which will make the, what we, the tragedy of Ukraine pale by comparison. And uh, we can't afford that. The world can't afford that. I don't think China can afford that. But that doesn't mean they won't choose it. We, we as a global community have to encourage them not to. And finally, a problem for which I have no recommendation or solution, but that, that I do think uh, has great internal uh, and external security risk is the economic downturn. We've had a pretty stable, positive economic environment with fits and starts in the first 20 years of this century. They're, you know, the, not without troubles, but the pandemic was a very significant setback. And now we've got an even greater downturn. And that presents internal and external risk that, again, I don't have a solution for. 
but we have to realize that when we consider the dangers of the time, uh, the the competition, the um, the need for resources of a down economic environment are real and have security implications. And, um, and I again, I wish I had a solution for that, but it worries me. Worry is not my favorite thing. The regionally, I I would like to speak to uh, all the issues, but I think of of each country that's in attendance on this webinar. But I think we'll save that for the questions, because I don't know. It's been a while since I've traveled in the region because of the pandemic, with the exception of Chile, which is a Pacific nation. Um, but here are things that I think are security challenges you all face, whether you're in India, the Philippines, the um, Nepal, Bangladesh, name a, name a country, all of which I've visited and I miss see, seeing you all in person. Uh, here, There are external regional challenges that require cooperation. The rise of authority, authoritarian governments, big or small, is a challenge that has to be addressed. It's bad. It, it, it's just bad. And it's not just that we're getting authoritarian governments, it's that some already authoritarian governments are becoming more authoritarian. And that creates internal and external strife and presents danger to neighbors and regional, regional neighbors and partners. Um, the existing border disputes uh, are uh, problematic in almost every country on the, the uh, on the uh, webinar today, and that makes border security an issue. We certainly see that in the United States, not as much in um, in uh, Hawaii, but elsewhere in the U.S. because of the crime, the immigration issues, and the drugs that it brings. But what it really brings, what that does, is tear at the fabric of the rule of law. When you allow extra legal, illegal uh, border crossings and traffic and commerce or human trafficking, uh, you establish an environment of lawlessness that affects far beyond the border and far beyond those specific issues that I mentioned. Okay, and internally that can lead to ineffective governance and I think we're seeing some of that in the United States. I'm not a political guy and I'm not going to take political sides, but um, it, it, ineffective governance uh, is a security challenge. One of the few positive outcomes from the tragic Boxing Day tsunami in 2004 was the recognition by many governments, especially in Southeast Asia, that they needed to do a better job. And I would say that the United States went through a similar um, sort of some, you might call it an epiphany with Hurricane Katrina in the early part of the, of the decade. And um, so that, uh, that governance is a security matter. If you can't execute your job as a civilian government, then you're going to have insecurity when people or perhaps terrorist groups try to do it for you. <laughs> well, not for you, but against you. Uh, and then the last thing I'll talk about that I think is an issue we all have to address is societal fractures, where we wind up with groups against each other. And the United States is in a very fractious time, a very polarized time. Now, I've lived enough of our history and read enough of the rest of our history that I know this is somewhat cyclical in, the, in the, our country. Doesn't mean that we can just wish it away. But the essence of security is to have people invested together in security, in the matter of security. That's why it's so important for your, your security forces, police and armed forces, to be representative of the population that they protect and serve because it brings an investment by their family members as well as the individuals into the security secure into the security of the nation and the society 
And if you marginalize or isolate any group in your nation, there's a cost, there's a security cost. And there are folks I don't like, people who do things that I don't care for or disagree with, but we are all in this together and we can't escape that. And we have to work hard um, not, to, not to exclude uh, folks from our society or from pursuing our security. And that leads me to the last topic. I know I'm at about the end of my uh, 20 minutes here, and that's women, peace, and security. Those of you who knew me at uh, DKI APCSS know that that was my top priority. You know that because I said it all the time. And I said that not to be politically correct, because I'm not. I don't, you know, I'm 70 years old, folks. I don't have to care what anybody thinks. I don't have to work for anybody. I'm in a good place. The reason I care about inclusive security and in particular women, peace and security is it works better, period. And there's tons of evidence to, that says that. So, um, so include including women and other groups in security is better for your country. Uh, However, I have concerns. We've seen a lot of progress since UNSCR 1325 came into being, and that is that often inclusion, it, there, there are two, I have two concerns. One is superficial inclusion. So I spoke at the Naval War College in uh, Rhode Island on women, peace, and security about two months ago. And I said, I don't care about your pronouns. That's a thing in the U.S. now. Do you, do you want to be addressed by he, she, her, whatever, him, um, in terms of respecting gender, gender identity? I don't care about that. In fact, I'm, I'm irritated, not because I'm against people having gender identity or being addressed as they wish, but because it's a superficial element of inclusion just like quotas are, even though we set the quota for, for at least 20% at APCSS women, now it's far more than that. It wasn't about the numbers, it was about getting enough women there to normalize in a substantive way the participation of women in security matters. And it worked. And I saw evidence of that throughout my five years as the director, and I'll just, as, as a, a bit of somewhat anecdotal evidence uh, that carries on today, because I, of course, stay in touch with Pika Matauta, the current director, and get down to the center occasionally. Um, for those who've been there, you know that at commencement, commencement graduation from the five-week course, we ask the fellows to choose who speaks on their behalf at the graduation ceremony. And we, despite the fact that the percentage of women is 20 to 30%, a very significant majority of the speakers chosen are women. Now, that doesn't mean the women are better. It means that they are normalized in their participation in the course and in security manners. And that brings me to my closing point on women and peace and security. Women, peace, and security does not mean it's men, war, and insecurity. And no, we should no more marginalize the role of men in security matters or any other group than we do of women. We are all in this together, and there's no escaping that. So that's uh, as much as I can squeeze into 20 minutes. Uh, I hope it will inspire your questions, which are bound to be much more interesting than my remarks. So I'm going to put my email address in the chat window while we get to the first question. Dr. Jaswal, if you would please give me a question for me to answer. <clears throat> Thank you, General Lee. Thank you so much for the enlightening remarks. You have touched upon a wide range of challenges that South Asia and South East Asia is facing and is going to face. We have received lots of questions on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. Uh, so without taking much of time, let me jump to the questions that we have received on different, different platforms. Let me first go with those that we have received during the registration. The first is that, how do you look at Indo-Pacific strategy? 
what is the response of South Asia and Southeast Asian countries towards this strategy? Well, um, I I was figured that that would be one of the questions, and I might disappoint with my answer because um, I don't think strategy matters as much as consistency. Now, the U.S. policy and strategy was is notoriously inconsistent because we have elections every few years and we're about to have another one. Uh, parties change power and we get different approaches. But one thing that's been consistent is our engagement in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And the heart of any strategy, any approach has to be respectful engagement throughout. And that's diplomatic, that's military, and it's commercial. And it, it of course, is focused to some degree on allies, but it has to be just as well focused on partners and friends, but also those that we're having challenges with. We have to be in the region. We have to engage in the region. And um, I would submit that uh, one of the things the George W. Bush administration did very well was uh, select diplomats who were highly effective for the majority of the diplomatic posts in the region. One of the things the Obama administration did, President Obama had his team very actively engaged in regional um, meetings and regional organizations like ASEAN, SARC, et cetera. Uh, uh, we need to do both. So the strategy should be based on presence, respect for the interests of others and and continuous consistent engagement. So we have received lots of questions on Indo-Pacific strategy and China fact. Let me pick one more. How are South Asia and Southeast Asian countries going to balance China and the Indo-Pacific strategy or uh, the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't answer that for you all, right? I mean, it would be wrong for me to choose to say, here's what you need to do. You need to listen to the United States. Um, I, so I won't say that. I, that was um, histrionics, not, not direction. But I'd, I'd say have a long view and look at the available evidence. There you know, we're in a difficult time politically in the U.S. internally. There's no question about that. That will change. Look at the consistency of U.S. engagement and the modus of U.S. engagement. L look at what, what China has to offer and ask what you want your grandchildren to live with. Okay? And that doesn't mean that China should be marginalized at all. I've said many times in China, and elsewhere, that the nature of the uh, 21st century will be largely defined by what the US-China relationship looks like on December 31st, 2099. It's, it's an inescapably important relationship that we have to work hard at, with, but, but we have our own interests. And it would be absurd to think that we're not going to pursue our own interests. Of course we are, just like Nepal and the Philippines and India, name a country. Of course, we're going to pursue our national interests. But all I would ask, how do you want that pursuit to look? Do you want it to look like you're being dictated to or that you're being treated in a heavy-handed manner? And the U.S. isn't perfect in that, but... I'd rather see China adopt an approach that is more considerate, more altruistic, and less purely self-serving. So what's the choice that you want to make for your children and grandchildren? And I don't mean exclude China. I mean influence China's role. Put demands on it. The U.S. has demands put it all the time on it all the time by our allies, partners, and friends. Uh, General Figure, recently China has come with global security initiative, which is called GSI. Do you see the mm -hmm. possibility of intense competition between China and the quiet countries, that is United States, Australia, India, and Japan in South and Southeast Asia? I see the possibility of, 
of competition, but not necessarily of intense com intense competition. You know, the that I do believe that the Quad countries and many others are concerned with the aggressive stance they've seen from China, and that there's that what we're seeing is a response and the response has to be thoughtful and um, careful compete don't confront unless absolutely necessary and think about what impact the actions will have as i said deterrence is a very it's really difficult i read an article a while back that said deterrence isn't rocket science a metaphor for very difficult intellectual pursuits in U.S. parlance. It, it, so the title was, it isn't rocket science, it's much harder. It's very difficult. So we've got to think about that. Some of that will involve investment in military capabilities and positioning of military capabilities. And the, a um, capable and ready military has a role in almost every nation's uh, national security, but it's not the answer. It's it's a component. It's not the answer. And if you don't have principled engagement in diplomatic and business circles, you're not going to be secure. Um, you you cannot. When we look at the world wars. Of the last century and the current conflict in Ukraine, <laughs> that's no way to get secure. You know, you can deal with an issue, but you're not helping your security. A, a capable military that deters conflicts is the best investment in security. Uh, General Fig, what is the impact of Russia-Ukraine war on South and South Asia? We've received lots of questions within this framework, like the impact of Russia-Ukraine war on South Asia or South yeah. Asia and how U.S. is going to balance. There are lots of questions uh, on, related to this topic. Yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, I think I, I have no more insight than anyone on this um, um, this in this webinar I know what I see on TV and read, but boy, there's a lot unknown, right? Here's here are the lessons that I did take away. Um, war is very unpredictable, and I share that, you know, with I'll share that with anybody, but I've shared that with folks in the People's Liberation Army of China, who at times seem to think that the war conflict to happen and they always preface it with we don't want conflict and they'll say but if it happens you know we'll have off ramps we'll have ways to limit the conflict my response is no you won't sometimes i say that in a more pithy way but my combat experience on the in the air and on the ground tells me that War has a mind and a life of its own. And any notion that you can finitely control the branches and sequels of where war goes is ludicrous. Um, and I think that we've seen that in, in the Ukraine. If I were China, a, a lesson relevant to what I said is an extra regional concern for South and Southeast Asia, the lesson I'd take is the, the military action against Taiwan would be folly could be a perhaps a victory is it would be a very pyrrhic victory and the second and third order consequences would be devastating to china frankly i, I really believe they would be sadly to the south asia and southeast asia and the rest of the world as well but um um so don't start a war you can't finish and guess what you can't finish most of them so don't start a war i, I mean that sounds pretty simplistic but that would be what I think we should learn. Um, the next thing I'd say is history matters, but don't history drive, don't let history drive your future. And I think this is an important lesson for all of us, but particularly in South in Asia, uh, not the only place, but some of the conflicts that I'm familiar with have historical underpinnings. 
I was preparing to do a, an episode of my webcast, Pigments on uh, the Power of Imagination, on uh, Russia, Ukraine. And I said, gee, I wonder, uh, I'm thinking about civilian loss of life. So I wanted to look at a, uh, the civilian loss of life during World War II per capita. Um, and I looked at a global map, something I just searched for on the internet, and the greatest civilian loss of life per capita was centered right there in that part of Russia, what is now Ukraine and Belarus. And it was bright red and it was different per capita than everywhere else. Have we learned nothing? Much of the dispute is historically based. As you said in your bio, I, I am a huge proponent of the US Vietnam relationship, partly because I enjoy Vietnam. I got to know many fellows here at APCSS, um, but really because it's an exemplar. The U.S. and Vietnam has, have built a constructive relationship to part, despite a very uh, difficult and bloody recent past. Why can't everybody else? I've lived in Korea for South Korea for four years and Japan for four years. I've, respect, admiration, and affection for both countries and cultures. But they'll inevitably say to me from either side, well, you don't understand the history. I do. I just don't care. And whatever you do, don't mention Confucius to me because we do not honor our ancestors by sacrificing the future of our children and grandchildren. So if, if there is a lesson from Ukraine, it's the historical underpinnings of the conflict should scare the daylights out of all of us and make us say, we're going to do better in the future. And I don't care. I mean, it doesn't render the history or the tragedy or the bad things that were imposed on one or the other uh, nation. doesn't render them unimportant. They're just not more important than the future. So work at a better future. And I can't think of a more important lesson from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Zinul Fig, we are running out of time, but still we have lots of questions. Let me take two or three more questions. Uh, the yes, I, I'm happy to. Uh, the Sino-Pakistan axis poses an intense security challenges for India. There is also the Russia-China axis. How are these axes going to impact South Asia and Southeast Asia? Well, they're going to impact South and Southeast Asia if choices are forced upon individual nations or regional organizations. Um, so we ought not allow that to be the case. And, and the United States, in its strategic competition with China, I think does work at, but needs to continue to work at, avoiding the imposition of our way. We, we like to, so it's my way or the highway. In other words, if you don't, Go with me, you're out. Uh, forcing binary choices aren't, it isn't a good strategy. China is in the world. They're going to be in the world. They have a powerful economy. We need to accommodate that presence without appeasing aggression or un unlawful authoritarian behavior. That's not easy. But so whatever the axis is, we can't we can't let it overpower bilateral and multilateral relations that are productive in nature. Um, so but I think that's that's really the, the key. There is understanding that those different tugs, those different pulls on alliance or or affection are there, but but we are, we are truly all in this together. Uh, the next question is, what kind of regional cooperation is required in South and South Asia to deal with the emerging security challenges of the region? Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, effective regional organizations. I will cite ASEAN, and the omission of another one is because I think, at least in my experience, the other organizations could have done better. Um, uh, you know, ASEAN has a long history, and many in the United States dismiss it, have dismissed it in the past uh, 
as not doing much. Sometimes not doing much is actually doing good. It doesn't encourage conflict. Um, but, I'm, but I'm torn by saying that because uh, my last engagement in Myanmar was before the coup and before the tragedy that's occurring right now. And ASEAN was a big part of um, drawing us into engagement with Myanmar as things were looking better. Now, sadly, that has gone completely down the toilet and it's tragic. But regional organizations, by providing a forum where um, the partners can gather and share views and disagree, but still realize their regional stake, their regional shared interests and cooperate to some degree is very valuable. Um, Security only alliances are not as valuable. You know, NATO, I, I fought a war for NATO. Okay, NATO was necessary during the Cold War. Now it's a construct that, you know, we're stuck with. It's not going to go away. But the beauty of regional organizations is when their focus is on a better peace and a better future, more than the worst case conflict scenario. They still have a role in that. It's just not their focus. But to do that, they have to be effective. And to be effective means they have a purpose, an understood and shared mission, and that something comes out of what they do. SARC, uh, in my experience, and it's been a while, was focused on one important matter, but that limited its effectiveness in other, I'll say lesser included cases, but, but the fabric of that is... Um, it, it exacerbates any major case like India, Pakistan. A little move to the last question for today. Do you see the possibility of arms race in Indo Pacific region? There is news that Japan might acquire nuclear submarines. Uh, don't you think that South Korea would be next to require it? What, uh, which might be followed by many other countries in the region? So, how do you look at it? What is the future of dis disarmament in this region? Let me let me answer that question in two parts, and I'll choose the parts, Dr. Jaswala. The uh, um, I think I've been asked about the arms race in the Indo-Asia Pacific region, including South Asia and including Southeast Asia, um, very steadily since I got to PACOM in two thousand three, two thousand five. It's not a new question. It's not changing, um, and and therefore I, I kind of don't uh, don't care very much about this ar the arms race question because it's it's always out there. I do care about investment in irrel in, in capabilities that are not necessarily relevant, and. How would a nuclear submarine lessen the likelihood of aggression against Japan? I have a hard time seeing that. I also have a hard time seeing how they would make it effective uh, as a capability because submarines are really hard. Nuclear are difficult to employ and, and operate and everything else. And nuclear submarines are even harder. But they're a, they're a glossy capability that countries have sought over the time. I think it's I, I don't think it's very cost effective, frankly. Aircraft carriers are another one, and there's a big country near near y'all that's doing that right now. Very expensive, very hard to operate. In some cases, relevant, perhaps for a large, great power, if you will. But everybody doesn't need one. And when you have only so much to invest in your national security, find the greatest capability for the least invest investment and one that can be maintained and sustained and effective. Uh, General Fig, here we come to the end of the discussion. We still have around 20 Darn it. questions, but we have to, we have time questions. We'd like to thank all of, uh, we'd like to thank you for your valuable time and we hope to have you again in future, maybe in real in Kathmandu. We'd also like to thank all our valuable participants who joined us early morning in spite of their busy schedule. Uh, thank you for in, uh, interesting questions. 
Then we fit good night and good day to all our participants from yeah. Uh, thank you. If I could, if I could, thanks uh, very much for asking me to do this. But please, everyone, uh, my email address is info at phase minus one dot com. Info at phase minus the number one dot com. And I'd love to hear from you. It's good for me to be engaged. I'm sure I'll learn something. So thanks, doctor, and aloha. <laughs>